Greetings people, I am Lucifer Surf and welcome back to Final Fantasy VII. Before we continue, however, there's a small detail about the last episode which I forgot to mention. It seems that Eris is carrying a piece of pale green material that seems to serve no purpose. This is an important plot point and I should have mentioned it. However, it's not mentioned again until about the midpoint of the game. And then it's completely forgotten again until about two dungeons before the final boss. Anyway, in the last episode we had a first-hand look at parental neglect. We discovered that Barrett doesn't understand how civil service works. Jesse seems to have little to no concept of distance and the measuring thereof. And the churchgoers of Midgar worship ICBMs inside the TARDIS. Moving on, we find our hero asleep. Quietly listening to the voices in his head and dreaming sweet dreams about relationship advice from his mother. He's to his own, I guess. Upon waking up, Cloud realizes, I must have fallen asleep. No shit. He decides to take Elmira's advice and leave early without Eris. Sneaking past her room is easy enough if you don't run. Hug the bookcase and then the banister, and getting caught just means starting again. Once Cloud escapes the Maleficent clutches of luxury, run through the town and head west. Whereupon we discover that Eris has the power of instant transmission and is sat there waiting for you. Whether you like it or not, she's coming with you. So accept your fate as a henpecked protagonist and follow the path behind her. This is a new area and with new areas come new enemies. The hedgehog pies you've encountered before in the church. But next up is the vice. Little more than a mugger in a blue waistcoat. Relatively weak with 68 HP, but with a nasty ability to steal your items and run off. If it manages to run off, you lose the item. But if you can kill it before it escapes, you get the item back. Next up is the Hole Eater. Kinky. I've got no idea what they're supposed to be, but what they are is a pain in the arse. They attack in groups and wail on you non-stop, often attacking twice in one turn. And when you've got four of these bastards to deal with, they can easily overpower you. And with 72 HP each, these fights can last longer than desired. They've got no specific weakness and magic has little effect on them, so attack mercilessly and keep your health up. And finally, the Hell House. Now, I'm gonna level with you, I've got no idea what this thing's deal is. It's a house that attacks you with blinding gas attacks and mortars, and then transforms into a 10 foot tall battle robot and breathes fire at you. I wish I could make this shit up. And with a HP count of 450, this thing could be classed as a mini boss. It's pretty strong, but it's got next to nothing in ways of physical defense. So just attack it and keep your health above 100. Once you make it through this rather small area, Cloud and Ares come across an old children's playground. After climbing onto the slide, and after a rather awkward silence, Ares asks Cloud what rank he was in Soldier, to which he replies, I was... first class. The hell? What, did he have a stroke or something? Did he die for a second? Oh, I was... <laughs> first class. This guy's unstable. Now we've seen this happen before back in the church and it will no doubt happen again. Now the reason for this will become clear in the far future, so don't worry about it right now. It turns out Eris once had a boyfriend in Soldier with exactly the same rank as Cloud. Apparently it wasn't a serious relationship, but she hasn't seen him for a long time. And this is why Elmira didn't want Cloud hanging around. She seems reluctant to tell Cloud the guy's name, but before Cloud can complain, a chocobo-driven carriage drifts past with Tifa in the back. Either out of curiosity or an urgent need to distance herself from Cloud, Eris runs after the carriage. Follow her off-screen and head north to enter the next area. Welcome to Midgar's local sleaze pit, the Wall Market. It's like Walmart, but with more prostitutes. This place is essentially a new town, so feel free to explore. The weapon store has some nice items. And the inn is fairly cheap. Sadly, however, the item store seems to be broken. I see you. Or it could be in full working order. It's hard to tell. This town does indeed have a working item store, but it's called a pharmacy and it's the building with the big cat outside. 
Once you are ready, head through the southeast exit and arrive at the Honey Bee Inn, a hotel of negotiable affection and a terrible sales pitch. Ah, welcome! Even unpopular dweebs like you may meet their destiny here. Prick. Talk to this guy about Tifa and he'll tell you she's currently in an interview with the local crime lord, Don Corneo. His mansion is on the north end of town, but the bouncer won't let Cloud in, because he's a man. Even though she seems willing enough, Cloud won't let Eris go in alone. So Eris comes up with an alternative plan. Put Cloud in a dress and pass him off as a potential employee. First things first, we need a dress. The local tailor is one screen down past a big tent. Talking to the woman behind the counter reveals the only person who can make a dress in such short notice is her father. Her father is currently liquidizing his assets in the local bar. That's one screen up, opposite the weapon store. Since this guy is partially pickled, it takes Ares a while to convince him. Finally resorting to the old, he's always wanted to be a transvestite routine. The dressmaker decides this could be interesting and asks Eris what kind of dress he wants. Going from worst to best, asking for something that feels clean gives you a cotton dress. Something soft and shiny gives you a satin dress. And something soft that shimmers gives you a silk dress. Once he has your order, return to the tailor shop to receive the dress and try it on. Using the time-honored method of every mother in existence, i.e. opening the curtain while you're halfway through getting changed to check on you, Please say it's not just me. Eris decides that Cloud needs a wig to complete the look. The dressmaker informed you of a local wrestler that could help. Now, before we collect the wig, I'm sure we can make this slightly more awkward for Cloud, so, um, let's say we go do some optional shit. First stop, the diner. That's the building next to the safe point. Order any dish you like and tell the cook that it was all right. For this, he'll give you a coupon for the pharmacy. Go to the pharmacy, one building down, and choose one of three medicines. Again, worst to best, disinfectant, deodorant, and then digestive. Return to the bar and talk to the woman in the lavatory. Give her the medicine, and she will give you cologne. Hmm, okay, now we have a dress, we have a wig pending, and we've got some perfume. So what's missing, what's missing? Headwear! Go to the Materia store, directly above the safe point. The owner asks Cloud to spend a night at the inn, and grab a sample from the vending machine. You'll need 10 gil for one night at the inn, and, once again, from worst to best, 50 gil, 100 gil, or 200 gil for the item. Return the item to the Materia store owner, and he gives you the tiara. Okay, so we've got a dress, we've got a tiara, we've got some perfume, and we've got a wig in progress. But to pull this off, we need to do some... we need to do some method acting. How can we do this? How can we get into the mindset of the average woman? Panties! Next to the town's entrance, you'll find a guy who will give you his membership card for the Honeybee Inn. Talk to the bouncer and enter the inn, leaving Eris in the clutches of local perverts. You have two options here, the expletive room or the group room. Your choice doesn't matter, but I chose the group room because I'm free-spirited like that. Whereupon nine large men in gym shorts and mankinis strip Cloud down and jump into the bath together. What, you didn't think this was going to be a group of women, did you? I did. Once this ordeal is over, Cloud receives some underwear. Yay. The northern door of this place is the dressing room. Here, Cloud can receive some makeup, but getting decent makeup is a random chance, so don't bother. There are two other doors in this place. They both have keyholes, and Cloud has eyes. <laughs> Sadly, the first door just has an old couple feeling ill at ease at spending their holiday in a brothel, and to be honest, I don't blame them. The second door, however... The winds come now. 
The curse of the resurrected Satan. Our beloved queen does not awaken. The time is ripe. A legend has been passed on through generations. They sought the promised land. One with blue eyes and a great white sword upon his back will not lead us to the promised land. The fuck? Anyway, leave the inn and regroup with Eris. Apparently she's been spending her time selling flowers for outrageous prices. The time has come to get a wig. Head north and enter the large tent. The owner of which is Big Bro, a transvestite with a wig to spare. However, you have to earn it by beating his star pupil at a squatting contest. I can't believe I just said that. To do this, you need to press the switch, cancel and OK buttons in the order, about 20 times. But you are allowed to practice so you can get your timing right. I'd recommend about a half second pause between each button. Losing gets you the wig, a draw gets you the dyed wig, and a win nets you the blonde wig. Once you're ready, save your game and head to the tailor to don your new outfit. Once you've changed, head back to Corneal's mansion. This time the bouncer lets you both in. Head upstairs and to the left, and you'll find Tifa in what I can only assume is some kind of S&M dungeon. After some filler dialogue, she finally gets around to telling you why she's here. On their way back from the bombing mission, her and Barrett caught some poor sod, who told them that the Dawn has some information about a secret Shinra mission. Tifa decided to come here and try to get some information out of him, much to the dismay of Barrett. Barrett told me to leave the lek alone! For fuck's sake, Google Translate is not your friend, Square Enix. Long story short, the Dawn is looking for a bride. To do this, he chooses one of three women to spend the night with. Your choices in the last area dictate which, inverted commas, woman he picks. Tifa is default, next is Eris, and if you collected all the best items, he picks Cloud. Now, it's possible to make Cloud try to kiss this guy, but frankly, I've already made him a transvestite, endured a soapy sweat bath with the local wrestling team, and squatted a man into submission. I've had enough homoerotic subtext to last me an eon or two. Regardless of the outcome, the team now has Corneo cornered and scared. And with the threat of testicular torture looming, he reveals that Shinra now know that Avalanche are located in the Sector 7 slums, and their plan is to blow the support pillar holding up the sector above them, thus causing the entire town to come crashing down on the Avalanche HQ. Before you can leave, however, Corneo opens a trapdoor, dropping the team into the sewers. Meanwhile, in the Oval Office of the President, and I shit you not, this room is indeed oval, we see a huge beard in a green suit explaining to the President that the plans for murdering the population of Sector 7 are proceeding smoothly. This is Heidegger, a Shinra executive and, oddly enough, head of public safety. The President seems pleased, but a man in a navy blue suit believes there must be a less drastic solution. This is Reeve Chuesti, another Shinra executive, and he has a good reason for not wanting to destroy a section of the city, what with being head of urban development and all. The president ignores him and proceeds with the plan, the plan being to blame the whole thing on Avalanche and claim glory by helping the survivors. Back in the sewers, Cloud, Eris and Tifa get confronted by Conneo's pet monster. Meet Apps, some kind of minotaur. This thing has three main attacks, a tail attack that does about 30 to 40 damage. A lick ability that does minimal damage but inflicts you with the sadness status effect. And sewer tsunami that can inflict about 40 to 100 damage. This is the attack you need to watch out for. Apps likes to spam this attack constantly. It even counterattacks magic by casting sewer tsunami twice. This fight can cause problems if you're not prepared. Bring a lot of potions and some hypers to counterattack sadness. 
Strategy-wise, this thing is weak to fire, but as I said before, this thing counterattacks magic with a double sewer tsunami. If Cloud has the cross slash limit break, he can paralyze apps and simplify the fight entirely. Other than that, keep your health above 200, and once Apps has taken 1800 damage, the fight is over. With that out of the way, the team must find their way out of the sewers. This place is easy enough to navigate and the enemies are a pushover. The Sahagin, some kind of anthropomorphic turtles with spears, have an ability called Shell Defense that makes all your physical attacks pointless. They have no weakness, but magic works well to relieve them of their 150 HP. The Caesars pose no threat whatsoever. 120 HP, weak attacks, and ice spells kill them almost instantly. The sewers are easy enough, but don't forget to pick up the steel material on your way out. Once outside, Tifa tells you that navigating the trains that are lit up is their best way to get past this place. This place being the Train Graveyard. As the name suggests, you'll have to navigate the remains of long-forgotten locomotives. Now, to be honest, there's only one route through this place, but the layout gives the impression of a maze. Take Tifa's advice and look for the trains that still have lights. Everything else is just background colour. Enemy-wise, we have Cripshays. A small imp-like creature with huge mandibles. Pretty weak, and only 100 HP. The Dean Glow are dragons that absorb ice attacks and receive half damage from lightning spells. With 120 HP and high magic defense, they can be a problem. So stick with physical attacks and keep your eye on your health. You can also steal ethers from them if you equip the steel material. Next up is the Ghost. These guys can be a pain in the ass. One hit from anything and they turn invisible. While invisible, they can't be harmed but attack them again and they reappear. Being undead, healing spells make short work of them. Other than that, try fire and watch out for their drain ability. After 130 damage, the ghosts go down. And finally, we have Eligor. This guy may look impressive, but he can't fight for Toffee. His attacks are incredibly weak, but he can cast sleep on your party. If you find him, try to steal a striking staff from him. This is a weapon for Ares, and the best one she's likely to find until you reach the city of Junon. Aside from that, just beat his 300 HP out of him and leave. In the northern half of the graveyard, your path is blocked by a couple of derelict trains. Fortunately, one of your party knows how to drive these things. My money's on Ares. Once the trains are moved into a more convenient location, you can get past. Once past the trains, head west. You'll find yourself in the Sector 7 slums train station. Keep heading west to find the support pillar. Sadly, the party arrives too late. Shinra's attack is already underway, and the sound of gunfire can be heard from above. You soon learn from Wedge, after he gets knocked off the pillar, that Barrett is up top holding the fort. Tifa asks Ares to go to the 7th Heaven Bar to get Marlene as far away as possible. Save your game, and head up the pillar. It's just Cloud and Tifa in your party right now, but thankfully the only enemies you'll fight here are the Aero Combatants. 190 HP with weak attacks and low defense. Beat them up with physical attacks, you'll need to save your energy for the boss. Once you reach the top, talk to Barrett and get your team ready for another boss battle. Sneaky as always, the Turk's operative Reno returns and manages to trigger the pillar's self-destruct system. You know, Barrett, you can shoot him. It's not like he's moving or anything. Tifa states that they need to disarm the bomb. No shit. But as Reno puts it, no one get in the way of Reno and the Turks. To punish this idiot for his bad grammar, the team decide to take him on. He'll start the battle by casting Pyramid, encasing a random party member in, well, a pyramid. These things have 10 HP and no defense, but if the entire party gets trapped in them, it's game over. His other attacks are the Electro Mag Rod, that does about 60 to 70 damage. This can stun a target for a short time, and it can also change their position in the party. 
That is, if they are in the front row, it can knock them to the back row, and vice versa. He's also got a standard attack that does about 50 to 60 damage. This fight is more of a time sink than a challenge. Reno has 1000 HP and will run up when the battle ends. The bomb is apparently set on a timer, and the team can't disarm it. While they're wondering what to do next, a helicopter appears with another Turks operative on board. This is Seng, the current leader of the Turks, and he has Ares as a hostage. Ares tells Tifa that she is safe, and then warns them to hurry and get out, at which point the pillar starts to collapse. With no other option, the team, thanks to Barrett's quick thinking, escaped the sector's destruction by swinging Tarzan style with the help of a handy crane hook. However, what that hook is attached to is anyone's guess. If you take an interest in these things, the music the president is listening to is The Creation by Joseph Haydn. Once the team regroups, Barrett is, understandably, slightly miffed at the loss of his friends, his home, and potentially his daughter. After they calm him down, they soon work out that Eris was talking about Marlene when she said she is safe. Whereupon, Cloud decides to return to Ares' home to break the bad news to Elmira. On the way there, one of the many voices in Cloud's head speaks up. In my veins courses the blood of the ancients. I am one of the rightful heirs to this planet. Cloud believes this to be the voice of Sephiroth. Once the voice has passed, return to the playground and pick up the Sense Materia. This allows you to see the health, magic strength and weakness of almost any opponent. And then return to Ares' home. Before we get there though, head into this house and go upstairs. Examine the posters on the wall to read the Turtles Paradise Flyer. This is important for a side quest which isn't received for a long time. Once back at Ares' home, Elmira informs them that Ares chose to go with Seng in return for Marlene's safety. We also discover that, like Marlene, Ares is adopted. Elmira's husband was fighting in the war and due to return home on leave. Elmira found Ares at the train station while waiting for his return. Eris's real mother died there, leaving her daughter in Elmira's care. Soon afterwards, the Turks tracked Eris down, claiming she was the last surviving member of an ancient race of humans known as the Satra, a spiritual people with the power to commune with the life stream. This is later proven when a young Eris informs Elmira about the passing of someone close to her, a full three days before Elmira receives a letter informing her about the death of her husband. I'll explain about the live stream at a more appropriate time. For now, the team, after trusting Marlene's safety to Elmira, heads out to rescue Eris from the Shimra headquarters. Next stop, the Wall Market Weapon Store. You'll see a man working on a tank to the left of the store. Talk to him with 300 gil, and he'll sell you some batteries. Then head towards Corneo's mansion and follow a group of children off-screen. A young girl tells you that the debris from the collapsed sector has formed a path that reaches up to the top plate. The team decides it's worth a shot, since there are no more trains that lead to the Shimra HQ. Climbing the debris is easy enough. There aren't any enemies and it's a linear path. You'll have to use the batteries at set points to progress. Once to turn a propeller. And once to raise a barrier forming a bridge. The third battery is used to open a chest, which contains an ether. The only thing you may have trouble with is this swinging bar. You'll have to time your jump right to pass forward. It'll take a few tries, but the game will tell you if you press the button too soon or too late. 
Soon enough, you'll reach the front door of Shinra's headquarters. A huge looming fortress full of puzzles, elevators, winding corridors, endless staircases. And somewhere at the top, a young woman who's counting on you to save her. But such things can wait until part 4. So please join me next time for a full frontal assault. <laughs> Take care of yourselves guys. I hope to see you soon, but until then, this is Lucifer Seraph signing off.